Go live in a community that has schizophrenics in it. Because they, despite media, despite the movies you've seen, despite all of those fictional things that you have seen, people with schizophrenia have a far less probability of harming you or killing you than your next door neighbor has. I want this to sink in. Someone with a mental illness has a far less statistical probability of harming you than does your next door neighbor. But let's look at the concept of mental health. Mental health, as we will see, should be defined as what is mental health? The mental health, what is mental health? Mental health is not the absence of mental illness. It's not the absence of psychological disorder. Mental health is the absence of being able to thrive, be productive, be a human being in the sense that we can get up, we can be productive, we can make some achievement in our life. Mental health is not the absence of mental disorder. And as this quote suggests, vulnerability is not a weakness. That's a myth and a profound danger. Because what does it do? It makes us assume that someone who does a mass shooting must be weak. And therefore, they must have a mental illness. And therefore, they're dangerous. But as I have said, the objective evidence says individuals who have a mental disorder are less dangerous than your neighbor or your spouse or someone within your family. And we need to understand this from a statistical perspective. But the question becomes then, okay, we can have mental weaknesses, right? Things that can affect the decisions we make that may not be to our best benefit, that may not be to our best abilities. It's not an illness. It's whether we're acting mentally healthy, productiveness, um, gaining interest in our family, um, making so that we can produce so our family survive and we can live in this world and be happy and productive versus someone who is not mentally healthy. Those individuals who are antagonistic towards us, towards people, those people who are always the at risk for a mental disorder who are who who may be the antagonist to what is healthy and that's where we're going to go with tonight's lecture so i want to bring up some 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 statistics from nami um that that kind of highlight you know, how much risk we are here in the United States for mental illness. On the left panel, we have adults. Those are people above the age of 25. So we're talking 26 and above. On the right panel, in the first section, we're talking about adolescents 12 to 17. And then we're talking about young adults between 18 and 25. Why are these divisions? Why don't we know anything about uh, nationally on a statistical basis above adolescence and below? It's because of privacy. It's because um, of protections that are given to people who are not in the adolescent years. When we get into our adolescent years, we have more privacy for our mental health so we can disclose those issues without parents being involved. And so I'm just putting that out there why NAMI does these cutoffs, why we don't know very much about children 
below the age of, of um, uh, 12 or adolescence. Okay, so I'm just putting that out there. So when we look at adults, these are individuals above the age of 26. In 2020, we see, and this is, the thing that I wanna emphasize is that this is when these numbers came out. Um, and, and, and for the new numbers, uh, I'm expecting them for 2021 to come out in this next year. So this is the year these are coming out. And so this is what we know at this point. We also have to note uh, at these um, implications that this was during the period of COVID. This is when we were in the, 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 the crux of this. The thing that I want to emphasize at this point, while the numbers are not quote unquote officials, official, we see these trends continuing. Even when we see COVID restrictions being taken away, we see more socialization, these trends are continuing. I'm going to say as a scientist, should we wait for the official numbers? Absolutely, but we see these trends continuing. So as adults in 2020 and, and probably today, according to trends, we see that one in five adults and let me put this in perspective. For Tana Otham Community College, our average age is 34. So this is the majority, and, and please, if you're under that age and in, in, in our younger groups, pre, please forgive me on this. But for the majority of Tana Otham Community College students, this is your community. This is your people, okay? We find that one in five have had mental illness issues and that one in 20 have expressed serious mental illness issues. Now, what is the difference between saying I have a mental illness and saying I have a serious mental illness? I'm gonna put this in perspective because both of those, these things need some type of response. They both need some type of treatment. Saying that I have had a mental illness experience says I had a sprained leg, which requires us to care for it and take for it. To say I have had one in 20 says that I have had a broken leg. Okay, which needs just that much more. It still needs the same attention as the one in 20, but uh, the one in five, but the one in 20 needs that more attention. They need more mental health, in this case, medical attention. But I just want to um, emphasize that statistic in this context. Okay. All right, so one in 15, twelve plus, and we and, and let's read down this twelve point plus twelve plus million adults have had thoughts about suicide. Okay, now let's go to this other category. Um, adolescents 12 to 17, age 18 to 25, we see, let's compare these, one in six compared to one in five, three million, okay, the statistics way out, okay, but let's look at young adulthood, 18 to 25, look at this, these are the individuals in our world, one in three, versus one in five in that older group, age group. One in 10 versus one in 20 in that other age group. If we put this 3.8 to the 12, point, 12 plus million, this group actually outweighs this 12 plus million group. What's going on here? 
What are we doing to our adolescents and our young adults? Yes, there's major issues with, with us in our age group on the average, 34 plus on average in TOCC and, and, and SCAC. But what is going on? Okay, let's explore this further. Let's, let, let, let's take this to another analysis. So we learned a lot from the pandemic. And, and this graph, I'm going to tell you, this graph, what this graph represents is the first 12 months of the major um, influences of the COVID-19 um, pandemic, okay? And, and we can divide it between the first six months and the second 12 months, okay? And in, in this, represents loneliness, which we know predicts depression, anxiety, all of these things. All of these are mental health predictors that we go along this line, okay? And so this little red line represents what we predict within a population. This little green line shows what was actually happening within a population what is what 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 we didn't predict okay and so this trend line i should say as far as sample size what happened at the beginning of the covid-19 epidemic is that uh, major psychological associations across the globe including america European, African, Asian got together and say, we need to measure what is going on across populations to this pandemic. So this, this sample that you're looking at on your screen represents over 500,000 500, people across the globe who continued to take this online and I will have to admit, we don't have a representative sample of those who don't have access to the internet and have access to those technologies. So I'm going to put that out there right at this moment. 500,000 people across the globe who had access to take this online survey about mental health that was occurring during the pandemic. And so what did we find? For the six, first six months, believe it or not, people were doing better, better mental health wise than they were doing pre-pandemic. If we look at the average line for loneliness, it would be set around the 2.5 to the three point level. Yet at the beginning of the pandemic, people were doing better as far as loneliness and mental health than they were doing previously before the pandemic occurred. And then we get here to about the six month point. And I should say these shaded areas that you see beyond six months, this represents deviation. This is people who were not being successful, this first line. And then at the bottom of the line, let me do this over here, this more clear line. These are people who are suffering. These were people who were doing okay. And then this line represents the average. So all of a sudden around the six month point, we have people who are widely different there were those who were suffering. There were those who were doing wonderfully. And then we have the average line. And we ask, what is it about those people who are doing amazing versus those people who are suffering? And this gives us a glimpse into the findings we find about those mass shooters who have survived, those people who have done things that we would consider horribly, um, this gives us an insight into the human condition about what makes a human 
mentally healthy. And it supported what we found in this research is it supported all of the research that we have found on the human condition, whether you are white, black, brown, whether you're German, American, Kana Otham, these findings show us what it means to be human. Because what we find is the differences. And we measure these differences on a whole bunch of scales. And we say, okay, there was this trend line where we were all the same. And then there's this whole bunch of deviation. What is the difference between these people, these people, and what happened before? And these were the results. And each of these results are what suggests what a society should do to prevent poor mental health, prevent poverty, prevent all of those things, mass shootings that we have seen in these recent days. And I don't mean to be so passionate about this, because, but it is an issue. It's an issue we need to resolve. So let's talk about these 10 aspects of being mentally healthy versus being mentally unhealthy. Not disordered, but mentally healthy versus being mentally unhealthy, which would contribute to things like violence, things like mass shootings, things like people doing things that are counter to what we should be doing as a society. Uh, as a society. And so I'm going to go through these factors. Again, if you don't like it, drop the class. You have until January 30th, but we're going to go through these. What are some things that we have found? The first one I'm going to start with is identity and culture and lack of identity and culture. And we got into this on Tuesday. We got into a bit of this on Tuesday when we were talking about um, language, symbolic interaction, and those issues there. But let me emphasize this important. When I talk about identity, what I'm talking about is an individual social identity. It's how they identify as a parent, if that's your case, a student, which we all are, a professor, if you are, um, as an employee in your profession, as a driver going down the road. Those are all of our social identities. When I talk about culture, culture is a subset of social identity. What I mean by cultural identity is do I have an understanding of me, the people I belong to, and that history of the people I belong to? Okay? And so, and what we find in research when we're even dealing with mental illness is that when a person does not have a strong social identity, who they are as a parent, a sibling, a student, a teacher, whatever it may be in your life situation, and when they don't have a strong sense of who they are culturally as an individual, this creates mental health issues. And indeed, if we were taking Psych 214 abnormal psychology, I would go into treatment modalities which show that treatments that include a person's social identity and their cultural identity are far more successful in alleviating symptoms of depression and anxiety and psychosis than are the traditional treatments that we implement, which are biological and the traditional tra uh, therapy that we provide, which focuses on the person as an individual separate from everyone else. And we'll get into this more later. But I'll bring up uh, 
I'm going to fully disclose to this class. I have mental health issues. Okay. As your instructor, I have multiple times tried to commit suicide. I suffer from clinical depression. I'm just going to say this again. Your instructor suffers from those things. Where do I access those issues? Where do I come up with this issue that despite being a professor, being a psychologist, being this, getting an education, doing, being economically okay, why is it that I should be suffering from a mental illness? Why is it when at the epitome of my success, I try to end my life? And it comes down to this issue. Because when I was being raised, I was told as a white American, my ethnicity, quote unquote, even though it's not an ethnicity, my lineage, my culture comes from the days of George Washington, Thomas Jefferson, um, Ben Franklin. That's what I was told being raised in this country. All right. But an epitome came to me at a moment, and this was, don't, I was suffering from my mental issues long before this, is that my grandma, who was the last to immigrate to the United States, and if it wasn't for her immigrating to the United States, I would not exist. She immigrated here in the 1930s. Think about that. And, but I was raised with this false identity of an American identity, this false identity of a false ethnicity that ethnicity was tied to towards a nation I belonged to. But in the truth, and the truth that I have come to understand, I'm an immigrant here. My cultural identity, yes, I'm proud to be an American. I celebrate the 4th of July. I do all of those things. But my people don't come from here. They come from Prussia. They come from Denmark. They come from uh, Icelandic places. And so all of my disconnect has come from that perspective that somehow I'm an American. Yet when we look at the majority of Americans that claim that they're American, Native Americans can claim that heritage, but less than 1% of Americans can say they came from the Mayflower or George Washington or those founders of quote unquote, this great nation. And we sit here and wonder, why is it people have such a sense of false identity? And we wonder why so many people are so lost in their world. I know this through my personal journey. That's what created my doctoral journey where I investigated identity and loneliness. And I found that people, when they're disconnected from their identity of who they truly are, become so isolated and so lonely and so hateful and so aggressive. 
So think about that as we think about identity and culture, as we go through this, the, the, this class. The other thing, which is another Western import, is the issue of situational happiness versus continuous happiness. Situational happiness is I am happy when Friday happens. I am happy when a birthday happens. I am happy when an anniversary happens. I am happy during a holiday. I'm happy during New Year's. That's situational happiness. Continuous happiness is something different. We all as human beings go through difficulties. We all will struggle. We will all go through trauma. But someone who has quote unquote continuous happiness approaches negative situations differently. They approach it with this idea, yes, I'm struggling, but there's something better to come. This is only momentary. Those who only have situational happiness feel like, oh shit, trauma happens, life happens, and my world is falling apart. There's nothing I can do about it. Situational happiness makes us look to that next horizon. We're not happy until Friday. We're not happy until the next birthday. We're not happy until that next holiday. And when we stretch that cognitive horizon more and more and more, we become sadder. We become more unhealthy. We become more mentally unhealthy. So that's situation two. Situation three, which we'll get into more as we move on into this lecture, is the issue of social connection versus loneliness. Loneliness and social connection have this variable between them. One, to be socially connected, we have to know that we have enough people to rely on, that we can call someone and they will be there in our time of need and they can call us and we will respond. The other part of it is emotional connection. This is having at least one person in our life that we can say anything to do to, and they won't criticize us. They won't make fun of us. They will sit there and they will listen to us and they can do the same to us. And we feel safe with those individuals. And as we will see in other slides, it might take another lecture we will see that this variable is associated with so many social wrongs that when we feel this loneliness, it predicts things such as violence, homelessness, um, poverty, family violence, and all of those things. This one variable can predict all of those things. Okay, the next two, uh, and I'm going to leave this with a explanation mark. The next two we can kind of put in the same category because I can relate them together. So I'm going to put a little circle by them is friendships versus toxic friendships, intimate relationships versus toxic relationships. Okay, the reason why in, in this type of literature about mental health, we, we use the word toxic is we use the word toxic in the same way chemistry does. When someone in chemistry says something is toxic, what they're stating is if you take a piece of metal and you put a toxic agent on it, such as acid, it doesn't immediately cut a hole through the piece of metal. It takes time. At first, it just feels like a piece of wetness sitting on the piece of metal. And then over time, it starts digging and digging and digging 
into the piece of metal until it creates the hole through the piece of metal and doesn't make the metal piece whole. Friendships and intimate relationships are the same way. In the beginning, friendships look amazing. Intimate relationships, he's the perfect man. He's the perfect woman. He's the perfect lover. In friendships, they support me. They want the same things I do. And then over time, in the friendship, they go, you don't have that control, I do. You're not that worthy, I am. You're, you're nothing compared to me. What, you're complaining? You don't have any more complaints than I do. You're just weaker than I am. That's toxicity. And what we know about mental health is when this toxicity between friends and intimate partners gets to the breaking point, to the hole of the piece of metal that the acid is going through, it destroys people. I'm going to go back to uh, the most uh, famous uh, uh, um, uh, mass shooting, which was the Columbine situation. When we analyze those two individuals who committed that murder, it had to do with toxic friendships and it had to do with toxic parents. In both of those situations, they had individuals who they thought were friends, who they thought were healthy parents, and they toxified the situation. The parents said, You're, why aren't you academically like those? Why aren't you that person? And the friends were like, I don't want anything to do with you. What are you? Who are you becoming? No. Uh-uh. That's what we saw in the analysis of the Columbine mass shootings is it wasn't that those boys were mentally ill. They didn't come to us with a dysfunction. Society, families, and friends, and communities created that dysfunction. And every analysis we have done on any surviving mass shooter, these two elements, it has nothing to do with the individual. It has to do with missed opportunities, missed chances for us to say, wait a minute, you are a good person. Wait a minute, son, daughter, you are worth something. Instead, the self-interest of our individualism in here in the United States where we need to compare people Parents and friends said, uh, compared to me, you are shit. And when we look at every analysis of mass shooters, we see this element of degradation from friendships and intimate relationships, whether it be a parent or an intimate partner. So I want us to think about this from a sociological perspective if you choose to stay in this class. If not, we're coming after you. The other aspect of good mental health is an engaging and an authentic life. This is the difference between thriving and surviving. Thriving is that I look forward to tomorrow. Authentic means I am going to be who I am regardless of the situation. And I'm going to bring this up. This is very much connected to the happiness notion that I mentioned above. So I'm going to connect these two 
with this very awfully drawn arrow. When we find people who are engaging and authentic, they tend to have continuous happiness. But engaging and authentic isn't the Elon Musks of the world. They are not the owners of Amazon. <laughs> I can't remember his name right now because I, all I can see is his bald head. Um, they are not the Donald Trumps of the world. They're not, they're not those people. Those people are probably incredibly unhappy. And I'm just putting that out there. People who live an engaging and authentic life find enjoyment in everything they do. In fact, when this research was done, the most happy people that we found in this continuous happiness people were not the CEOs, were not those who were striving for, they were mainly people who, according to American society, work media, medial jobs. The best example I could give in the qualitative research that I saw that combined who is most happy on an objective level, and then they went and interviewed those people, were actually janitors of schools and garbage men who collect our garbage. And I'm just going to bring this up about the janitors of the school, who tended to be some of the most happiest people in this world, who society deems as the less of the less. But what was the difference between these individuals and the rest of us? They didn't see their jobs as cleaning crap off of a floor or taking the garbage out. They redefined their life as I'm creating a safe and clean environment for children to learn. The happiest people that we have recorded in the United States are those kind of people, not the Elon Musks, not them. It is those people who find meaning in their everyday task, in their everyday purpose. And they see beyond what society defines them as. A janitor is not simply someone who cleans crap off of a floor. They are people who make a safe and clean environment for people to thrive and grow. Those are the happiest people in the world. So if you're seeking an education to become happier, if you're looking for a promotion, in your job and you think that will make you happier based on the United States cultural model, I hate to upset you, you're looking in the wrong places. You're looking in the wrong places. And this isn't just your professor talking, I can give you references to article, research article, research article, over and over and over that shows us. We need to stop looking beyond the horizon. And we need to encourage us and the people in our lives to start living today and being engaged today. Don't look forward to graduation as an example. Look forward to your next class and what you're gonna learn and grow from based on that. I want you to think about that. How many of us as students only wish we would get through Social 101 so we are one step closer to having our degree? But how many times do we miss opportunities to learn something in that pursuit? to gain something about ourselves. And I'm going to speak this even in math courses. I'm going to be honest with you. I was shitty at math. Okay, I want to give you guys my math experience. When I was in math, I started at math 110. 
zero, one, ten. Then I took math zero, one, fifteen, zero, one, twenty five, zero, fifty, zero, eighty five. 095, and then finally, I was allowed to take college mathematics. Okay? Why do I bring this up? I hated math. I hated statistics. I resented it because I wasn't good enough for that. But then something clicked along the way. I went along this journey and I saw the importance of quantification. I saw the importance of probability. I saw these importance. I failed my first statistics class, which here, here at TOCC is Math 225. I failed that class horribly. I barely made it through algebra and college mathematics, barely. But then something happened along the way, is I saw something that I could use, something that is purposeful. I see all these memes that ever since I graduated from college, I've never used algebra. Well, I feel sorry for those people, to be honest with you. Because once I went through that, and I went through those self-defeating periods, and then I started to look at, well, what is the purpose of that? What meaning can it bring to life? Today, I teach college level statistics. I just finished teaching a doctoral level statistics class. Why? Because way back when, when I understood the, uh, the, the, the issue of this abstract statistics and abstract mathematics, I created a simple equation that predicted from one year to the next how many domestic violence cases were going to occur in a community. And it had an error rate of plus or minus two, two, two individuals. And it was accurate. And I thought, wow. This math stuff actually works. But given history, given what I had about, I hated math. But once I started to engage it and give it some authentic meaning, it became something different. It became something new. And that's a point of in, living an engaging and authentic life versus just surviving. If we just want to get through Math 142, we're not getting to this point. And that's just my, my experience, and I'm just bringing that up. But that's what this means. The fourth, sixth thing is framing information in the positive versus the negative. Okay, we're all going to go through negative experience. This has a lot to do. I'm going to bring this back to this one. And I wonder sometimes if these variables should just be explained in this, the, this category all by itself. But there are people who frame things in the positive. They, yes, they accept the negative. They accept when they've been defeated. They say, you know what, this place isn't for me. This situation isn't for me, and they're able to walk away. But framing in the positive means that when you come across a negative, you don't instantly build a negative structure behind it. Uh, versus building things in a negative frame is when you instantly approach a situation and you instantly find everything wrong with it. A good example of this is, is, is I've heard stories and situations where people go to Disneyland or Disney World and um, they're with this person who just sits there. These places are advertised as like the happiest place on earth, right? So what you're supposed to experience there is pure happiness. And most people do. They 
experience average to 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 healthy elation but there are people who go to these places that are supposed to be the happiest place on earth and they look at mickey mouse and they go oh there's something wrong with him he must be a pervert he must just want to touch that kid because and and they view this word oh this parade what if these fireworks were just a much lower it would burn the whole place up and ruin everything what if the float behind them if they were driving too fast they would ruin everything okay this is just an example i i've heard these quotes sorry i'm bringing up my past trauma i think from disneyland and disney world but this is the situation that we're talking about when everyone instantly looks at a situation in the negative view instead of seeing the possibilities that contributes to our mental health the eighth thing is willingness to experience new experience versus stagnation so willingness to experience this can be guised in this whole concept that we've all heard about about being a lifelong learner about no matter where you are in your life we should continually learn and become better people versus the person who says i know everything and no one can change my mind that stagnation that is i know everything and there's nothing about your experience or anyone else's experience that could teach me anything different we find that people who are in the stagnant mode have very poor mental health. In fact, we find that re is related to mental health and psychological disorder. Okay, this one again, I think these are all related is um, being in an engaged world versus retreating from the world. And it's very similar to this concept here. It's about being active in the world. Do you donate yourself to your community? Do you donate yourself to your family? Are you, when you're at the family dinner, the, 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 the stereotypical at the table, are you there present? Are you listening to everyone else? Or are you just completely focused on where you are in your world and your place. This is the difference between engaged world and a retreat from the world. And again, we find that individuals who are in this domain tend to have poor mental health. And then the last one, we can't close this conversation without talking about, and I know that I'm at 645, so I'm gonna let you go after this biological and physical issues and i'm just going to leave this at this and we can continue the conversation on tuesday but our biological and physical health also play into how we view our mental health and our mental wellness and i'm going to live leave this one as a cliffhanger because i just realized that i'm out of time and so i'm just going to ask because we're over time and i'll leave the physical thing to next time, does anybody have any questions about what we have talked about tonight as far as mental health and what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the semester? Again, you have till January 30th to drop the class, but does anyone have any questions? No. All right, thank you, Michael. Okay, thank you, everyone. All right. It is tough, Angel. I totally agree. All right, everyone, let's get out of here for night because I've kept you over time. Have a wonderful rest of your evening. Enjoy your weekend. And please, please, please be healthy and be strong because our world needs you you as well thank you 
Thank you. Yeah, Such a good lecture.